All right, welcome everyone, and thank you for being with us today to start off the Global Islamic Studies Center's Afghanistan series of events. My name is Alia Khan, and I'm the director of the Global Islamic Studies Center at the University of Michigan. I'm also a faculty member at U of M's Department of English and the Department of Afro-American and African Studies. First, a little bit about us and the series. The Global Islamic Studies Center aims to promote the understanding of global Islamic culture and Muslim societies worldwide, not just the Middle East, but also Asia, Africa, and the Americas. If you're a Michigan student wanting to get involved with our center, please attend our events. But also, if you're an undergraduate student, you should declare our Islamic studies minor. The minor itself has no prerequisites and it's 16 credits. You can find more information on it on our website, but please do reach out and contact us and we can make sure that you have everything you need to declare. If you're interested in grad programs, please check out our Masters in International and Regional Studies or MIRS program with an Islamic Studies specialization. The application deadline is usually mid-December and you can usually find more info on our website. That master's program is 36 credits total and it's usually pursued over the course of two years. And then of course, third, if you're a student, faculty, staff, or just a community member who's interested in our events, please join our newsletter. Where we send out monthly newsletters and you can subscribe at the link noted in the chat. So today we're beginning our Afghanistan series. Today's event is part of this year's Global Islamic Studies Center's series on Afghanistan, in which we have three events this semester, two speakers and a film. The speaker series features two experts and scholars on Afghanistan. Today, Dr. Ahmad Kais Munhazim, Global Studies Assistant Professor at Thomas Jefferson University, and in October, Anand Gopal, journalist and author of the book, No Good Men Among the Living, America, the Taliban, and the war through Afghan eyes. We will also be streaming a women-made film on Afghanistan at the end of the semester. Also coming up, coming up in October, we'd like you to check out Halaloween, a Muslim horror film festival. Halaloween screens horror films from across the globe that were made by, for, or about Muslims with the hopes of understanding what scares Muslim audiences. Are horror films halal? This year we're hosting the festival online and we're screening one film a week for the month of October. We're giving you the remote and allowing viewers to watch on their own time. Each film will be available for a whole week. Please reserve your free tickets, watch trailers and more on our eventive site or Halloween eventive site that you see noted there. Our 2021 lineup is from many places in the Muslim world. On October 1st, we'll be releasing 122, which is a film from Egypt, on October 8th, we'll be playing KL24 Zombies, which is from Malaysia. On October 15th, we'll be playing Kandisha from Morocco. On October 22nd, we'll be playing Madayan from Saudi Arabia. And on October 29th, in Petagor from Indonesia. All of this info you can find on our Halloween eventive page. We'd like to thank today first our Afghanistan series co-sponsors. The Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, the Arab and Muslim American Studies Program and the Department of American Culture, the Center for South Asian Studies, the Digital Islamic Studies Curriculum, the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, the Spectrum Center, the Department of Middle East Studies, and the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. Now for the main event. Today, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Ahmed Kais Minhazim as our speaker. Genderqueer, Afghan, Muslim, and perpetually displaced, Kais is an, an assistant professor of global studies at the Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Kais was born and raised in Kabul, Afghanistan. As an interdisciplinary scholar, decolonial ethnographer, and community activist, Kais's work troubles borders of academia, activism, and art while exploring everyday experiences of displacements and war and conflicts in the lives of queer and trans Afghans. They will be giving a talk today entitled Flowers, Love and the Landscape of Violence, Queering War in Afghanistan. And we'll have time for a Q&A after. Guys. 
Thank you so much, uh, Aliyah, and also Anna for uh, inviting me and organizing this very, very important event. And I also thank all the uh, audience who have um, joined in, uh, despite the fact that it's middle of the day, uh, middle of the week. Uh, but thank you for being here and also showing support for the Afghan community um, that are uh, in Afghanistan and are on the scape or in the diaspora. Uh, before I start, I also would like to thank um, uh, the organizers, uh, but also the sponsors at the same time. I, will, I would like us to also um, send prayers for Afghans who are in Afghanistan right now under uh, perpetual violence of the past 43 years now um, and uh, continue to be in the in the coming years uh, but also uh, love and prayers for Afghans who lost their homes in, in the middle of the night um, and had to pack everything they had their dreams their future their past and small backpacks that some of them also lost it on the way um, and and thousands and thousands of Afghans who are stuck and wanting to be uh, evacuated or stranded in borders and refugee camps. My own family is right now at a refugee camp in, in Germany who do not know where they're going to be settled or uh, the uh, talks are that they might be given temporary visa for three years and then sent back. And there are thousands of other people in the same situation. And I'm also helping a large uh, group of queer and trans Afghans um, in Afghanistan that some of them um, managed to get out and we were able to evacuate a, a group of them to Islamabad. And now we are hoping to get them out to another country, but then another, a, a large number of them are still in Afghanistan because they don't have documents. So I want um, us to keep them in our thoughts and also prayers. Um, with that, I'd like to start um, uh, what um, I've titled it, uh, Flowers, Love, and the Landscape of Violence, Queering War in Afghanistan. Uh, this particular piece is uh, part of my recent research uh, that emerged as I was visiting uh, Afghanistan, my home country, after 10 years of not having documents to return home. I was able to go, and that return uh, in so many ways have really, really uh, been heavy on me because I've for once, I felt like I found home, and then it was taken away so quickly with uh, the new chaos and turmoil and return of Taliban just in the past month. Um, in the last two decades, uh, representation of Afghans in Afghanistan has been rendered to a people and landscape in void of love and life. In the heteropatriarchal and orientalist depictions, Afghan women have remained as historically oppressed and devoutly loveless, while Afghan men have moved between divinely masculine and categorically weak. The non-binary and trans and queer Afghans have remained invisible in so many ways, whether it's in the discussions, whether it's in um, right now evacuations, or it is also the questions around peace and security. These depictions have justified the continued war in Afghanistan and its subsequent everyday violence. Through a D slash colonial and visual ethnography of Afghans in Afghanistan, flowers, love, and the landscape of violence queers the war and Afghans lived experiences of violence in the country. My main uh, research um, from the very beginning and in my work, I always try to focus on everyday experiences of either violence or um, immigration and escape. My intervention here is to offer alternative lenses and methodologies to understand Afghan masculinities, femininities, and the in-betweens. It's interesting uh, that we are in this panel uh, organized by uh, people of color. And that's why I also feel this uh, sense of love and warm. Um, I, the other day, I, I attended a panel discussion on Afghanistan, and there's a lot of them happening in absence of a lot of Afghans and Afghan voices. Um, in that particular panel, um, one of the panelists, an old school uh, white orientalist uh, scholar of uh, security said, quote, Afghanistan is not a nation and never will be. Afghans are stubborn and fighters. They kill for the Pashtunwali code, end of 
the court. And it was very, very hard on me to sit there and, and in a way also um, not interrupt what I was hearing and this continued um, rhetoric about Afghanistan in very, very old Orientalist way. This Orientalist rhetoric about Afghanistan and Afghans is not new. And it wasn't my first time hearing it. It did not emerge now, nor in the aftermaths of 9-11. This rhetoric goes back to the first British colonial encounter with Afghans and Afghanistan in late 1800s. As Shah Mahmoud Anifi, a historian of Afghanistan writes, quote, the bulk of Western writing on Afghanistan framed the colonial encounter in military terms. It is always this flawed graveyard of empires, the scores, or the hyper-masculine Afghan man and the weak Afghan woman, in waiting of saving and in void of love, life, and dreams. In this particular piece and in uh, my work in general, I intend to bring a different side of Afghans and Afghanistan to the discussion, a side that's often politically neglected and perpetually erased. I will be sharing um, my screen uh, to show some of the images because my work blends in photography, art, stories, um, and with uh, many voices from the people themselves on the ground. The flowers you see, and I will be using in the throughout my um, work in this particular piece, these five flowers are flowers that I have taken from uh, my home country, but also my own uh, ancestral home in uh, the north side of Kabul, uh, where I was born, and this house was also uh, bombed and rocketed three, four times. I've lost a lot of relatives, aunts and cousins during those uh, violence. Um, the flowers also represent this side of uh, soft, kind, love and, 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 and um, feminine side of many, many Afghans that the world does, hasn't seen. But I also see use these flowers to protect identity of my uh, interlocutors and comrades, those who have given me the love and shared their stories and allowed me to take their photos for this project. I wasn't intending to use these flowers um, on their faces, as you will see, uh, but what happened in the past month has really, really um, jeopardized the, the lives and uh, security of many, many people who have worked with the international community or with the government or our artists and activists and queer and trans or other minorities. So to do that, I am also using these flowers on, on their faces in order to disguise their um, identities. Uh, but it also uh, creates what I am intending with, with in, in, in uh, terms of uh, flowers in the title. First, I just a couple of um, words on what do I mean by D slash colonial ethnography. This is something that also um, I have done with my previous work. When I was um, drawn towards ethnographic work, I was also aware of my positionality and the vulnerability of the population that I do research with. Oftentimes refugees, displaced, queer, trans women. And so with that, um, this border that I have created between D and colonial, um, this particular border is important for writing, speaking, discussing Afghanistan or any vulnerable populations from a colonial place. It's this border where my work lies. I'm Afghan, born and raised in Afghanistan and displaced multiple times in Pakistan, but also now in the US. My education is of a colonialist institution. I went uh, to, for undergrad in the US and also got my PhD in the US. I'm speaking right now and writing in language that I don't dream in. It's not the language that I uh, was raised with or my mother speaks when I talk. I'm in a place that occupied also my home for 20 years. 
this border represents the complexity of my own positionality as a scholar, queer, researcher, and those of the people I study and work with. And here I will share with you um, a set of photographs that I took in Afghanistan during my last visit, which was only this past summer, right before Kabul was um, seized by Taliban. The stories and images in my work bring to light the side of Afghanistan that is an Afghan would like to share and engage with. It might be uh, not a side all Afghans see or imagine or want to share, but it's a side that I want to share as an Afghan, as a queer, as per somebody who's now displaced from Afghanistan. Through these images, I place stories of love, friendships, family, and community against the landscape of war and violence that have continuously ripped lovers apart, families separated, and communities broken. These photo narratives of Afghans, some still uh, living in Afghanistan and some who escaped in the past three weeks, are the last archive of Afghans right before the return of Taliban. In the midst of the war in Afghanistan and escape of thousands of Afghans from the country, we tend to forget those in the margins, queer and trans, those living against the odds, and the Afghan men and women who travel the masculine feminine binaries. This particular photo um, is a collage. It, 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 it's that um, have been placed over each other. Um, the background photo that you see of um, King's Palace, which is located in uh, the west of uh, Kabul, uh, I took that photo in 2011, 10 years ago. A decade later, I returned to Afghanistan. Things had changed. And one of the major changes that I saw was the emergence of this very, very underground, beautiful, organic, and also very decolonial uh, queer community and trans community. The queer and trans community really, in a way, made me fall in love with home once again. I never imagined that I would see this community uh, with so much love in the midst of this drones of war and fog of war. Uh, but this is a new generation, a new generation that they are defining their own sexualities and genders. They also, some of them take that to the roots of who they were. And they, in many ways, it also have Islamic roots. These are um, majority of the people that I talk to engage with are very, very devout Muslims at the same time. This is a um, story of Rahim and Sohrab. Against the ruins of Kings, Palace, and Kabul. Rahim and Sohrab met at Kabul University while studying Islamic law. They both grew up in provinces where Taliban had control over the majority of districts, Helmand and Logar to be precise. They shared a dorm a few miles from the university where they pretended to be cousins, not lovers. Sohrab told me that if it wasn't for Rahim, he would have left back for his home in Logar. But the love kept him in Kabul and also at the university. Quote, people see us as these two masculine men with beard coming from rural Afghanistan, studying Islamic law, and they assume a lot of things about us. Little they know that we are lovers, soft inside like flowers. This is where the title of this piece emerged and I went around the city taking people's photos with flowers against the harsh khaki landscape of violence and war. This was an inspiration also that I took from this conversation I had with Sohar Rahim and Sohrab uh, about flowers and its importance in Afghan's lives where you'll see it blossoming in every rune, in every home, in every person in some way, incorporating flowers either in their clothes, in their homes, or, or in, on the streets, or even uh, street sellers on their um, cards. And what I did was when I would, uh, of course, approached people uh, who I knew, but also people who I didn't know, um, asking them for permission if they would be okay with photos. 
uh, we, this would happen also over course of a few days uh, that we would establish that relationship and that trust. And then I would go back with printed photos of them and then they would give me their stories or whatever they would want to share um, about themselves or whatever they wanted to share with the world. Laila and Karim, two lawyers who fell in love while on the official trip to a neighboring country to free Afghan prisoners. They got married in 2012. Laila told me, quote, I was not expected to propose to a man. I rejected a lot of proposals and people started to believe I will never get married and might start living with one of my women friends. Within the context of patriarchal world as a woman, everyone had assumptions about me and expectations from me. What they never expected was that I would propose a man. I knew we liked each other and enjoyed each other's company at work and on our official trips. I proposed to, I proposed to him and he said yes. This love, friendship have made it easier to live under this war. We both have narrowly survived three suicide bombings in our office and on the streets. We laugh about it, that if something happens to us, it might happen to both of us at the same time, since we are always together. Nargis and Marjan. Marjan tells me, quote, we met during our commute to university. We both took night classes at a private university miles away from our homes. As women, it was really hard for us to get to classes and make it home by the public transportation and that also at night. We both get done at 8.30 and head home. We would pray throughout the way and hold each other's hands tight so that we are protecting each other. Halfway, then my dad would come and get us. He has been the biggest supporter of our education. The world doesn't hear about Afghan men like my dad. He was an educator himself, so he makes sure that we are educated. Now that we have finished university, we are both breadwinners in our homes. Um, I was also in talk with both of them. Both of them have been fired by Taliban. Fawad, Haya, and Azad. Four queer friends met on a clandestine social media page for queer and trans Afghans. I met them at an underground club in Kabul where we would get together, dance to Afghan music, smoke shisha, and escape from the violence of war and homophobia just behind the walls of this dark, smoky room in the middle of the city in Kabul. Fawad tells me, quote, we are inseparable. We hang out every day with each other. What else one should do here? Kabul is all war and drugs. Young people are escaping from unemployment and war turning to drugs. We are helping one another not to get there. You will see people like us under bridges and in bombed houses doing all kinds of drugs. Nobody knows where this drug is coming from, but it's so easily available. And it has ruined so many young lives. When you see these people, they were just like us and now they're gone. We get together, dance, write music, create art, just so we stay sane. Jamil and Ratib. In this particular photo, um, you see um, the tanks. So tanks, um, are one of the markers and remains of violence and war throughout the country. Uh, if you go to big cities like Kabul, Mazar, Herat, Kandahar, Jalalabad, you'll see these tanks on the roadsides, on the hillsides, 
Um, and they have become part of the architecture and landscape of the city. I grew up playing on these tanks. And when I went back, my nephews and nieces were playing on these tanks. And so many generations have happened to play around and on these tanks as part of everyday life because there weren't any playgrounds. The only playground that in, in a way the war at offered us was these uh, destroyed uh, tanks that sometimes they would also have other bullets and other weapons around them. And so these tanks become also uh, part of queer hanging because they are in isolated places. So people go there and hang out, take pictures, um, or in a way find that sense of peace from the rest of the city because they are now placed in different outskirts of the city. Jamil and Ratib. One is in a refugee camp right now in Albania, and one is at a safe house in Pakistan. I met both of them together uh, in Kabul. They both became one of uh, the very first people I met from the queer and trans community who also then introduced me to the larger queer and trans community uh, where we would uh, talk and heal and write and laugh and create art. And uh, for both of them, um, I knew that living in Afghanistan was, was already very, very difficult because uh, they both were eligible for marriage and they have both had pressure from their families to get married and in a way to also prove uh, that they are man enough to get married and establish a family. On the other side, they also loved each other. And there was, this was very hard for them to um, navigate the life with the family and also the life that they had created outside the family. And so within this uh, past three weeks, uh, with the help of many other organizations and, uh, and friends, um, so I managed to, to get one of them to Albania and one is in, in a safe house in Pakistan and hopefully will be relocated to Ireland or Canada, the two countries that have offered uh, to help them. Um, Jamil called me last night asking if him and Ratib will be reunited again. I had no answers for him, but prayers. And they both met while painting murals in Kabul. These murals appear, started to appear in around Kabul city in the past few years because the Kabul that we all remembered in, in our early childhood days was so colorful and so beautiful. During the 40 years of war, it has really, really become very gray or khaki and foggy. And so these murals have started to appear by many artists to bring life and color to the city. And so both of these two uh, queer people, Jamil and Ratib, uh, were one of the few artists who would paint murals. And a lot of these murals had political and social messages around hope, love, unity. And some were also um, murals that talked about uh, the violence uh, of Taliban and women's rights. Salim, Nawab, and Muhammad. This is um, in Sharanau in Kabul, uh, which is very central Kabul where um, a lot of uh, the early uh, NGOs, humanitarian organizations, UN started to show up, but then they started to move on the out, uh, outskirts of the city. Uh, it's also um, the part of the city that is very, very dear and near to so many diasporic Afghans um, who are living in, currently in the US or Germany because they had some links to this place. And even now, uh, there's uh, when you go to this place, there's a lot of this sense of community and home even on the streets. The three friends who I uh, basically saw every day when I went to Sharanau um, are Salim, Nawab, and Muhammad. 
the three that you see in this photo. They would come, uh, sometimes they would invite me to sit with them and, and drink tea. Um, and sometimes they would show me the jewelry and, and things that they had. Um, Salim um, with, in white hair um, tells me, quote, look at my white hair. I was born in war and now I'm old. I didn't get married because I wanted to write. When you get married, you can't find the time to write. I wrote poetry books and then I went to acting. And then as we were talking, you would also tell me about his, the movies that he was in and some I remember. So that's how also we connected on that. I found these friends years ago. Salim tells me, actually during the Taliban in late 1990s, we would come here and hang out. We don't sell anything here. Nobody buys anything from us. We just come to talk about politics, read poetry and drink tea. None of us ever left Afghanistan. Everyone and everything we love is here. We won't leave this home now either in case the Taliban return. This was only a month before the Taliban returned and we had that conversation because um, some of the provinces were falling uh, under the Taliban rule. And so the conversation that I had with a lot of the people in these photos uh, and throughout my research and, and um, friendships, um, it centered in some, so many ways about the return of Taliban, the fear that everybody was expressing and the anxiety in the, about the future. Um, some of them were already planning their escape uh, either to Turkey, to Pakistan, to Iran, but then in that also um, for some it didn't happen. But at the same time, uh, these images also show uh, the life the, the love and, and the friendship that was happening in the city, uh, but also uh, that are absent in many representations of Afghanistan. Even now, uh, I was reading a journal, an Afghan journalist quote that uh, the world is talking about Taliban and the violence and everything, but there are millions of people who are still living their life. They're getting married, they are, um, falling in love and I'm still in contact with the queer and trans community in Afghanistan uh, in different ways. And in a way they have the sense of humor about uh, what's happening in Afghanistan that has also allowed them to um, stay sane and in a way not lose hope about future. I'm gonna stop talking about these here but I will also just want to show some of the other images um, that I took and I'm incorporating in my larger uh, project. Uh, these are also in relation to uh, women and especially children and girls that now are unable to go to uh, school, college or work um, right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kais, for that talk um, and for your engagement with our audience. So now we have at least half an hour um, for questions. So if you can use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to type your questions, um, I will read them out for Kais um, so that they can answer it. Uh, we have, okay, so our first question is from Chintan Modi. Uh, hello, Kais, warm greetings from a fellow queer person in M M Mumbai. Thank you for this tender, heartfelt presentation. What are your thoughts on Nimat Sadat's novel, The Carpet Weaver, which revolves around the experiences of queer Afghan lovers? To what extent does it represent the lived experiences of the queer people you met in Afghanistan? Um, I actually haven't read the novel, so to be honest. Uh, and that was also for, uh, lack of time, I would say, but also a lot of uh, the reviews that I heard first. And so uh, 
I haven't had a chance to read it, so I can't speak about this particular novel right now. Um, we have another question from Charlotte Karem Albrecht, uh, who says that this was such a moving presentation. Thank you. I'm curious about two things. Were your interlocutors involved in the staging and direction of these photographs or the collaging? Did they choose the flowers that they are holding? Yes, great question. I knew uh, that I will take those in the Q&A, so I didn't uh, explain much more about uh, what was happening. Uh, so yes, um, a lot of the direction that I was taking uh, was, was coming from, from the staging and how they wanted to hold flowers. And in some, they also choose not to show their faces and some they chose to show their faces. Um, and also the flowers that they would pick, I would have some uh, different kinds of flowers with me and some they would just pick a bouquet of it or just one flower. Um, and in, in the larger project, I have also many um, other images where people are wearing the flowers either on their hat or hair or uh, incorporated in their clothes. Um, and the interlocutors uh, in this project were quite involved because with some of them, I would actually go and buy these flowers together. Uh, and then we would also go around once we would do, uh, we would be done with the photos, uh, we would go and distribute it and give it to people as a, as a form of love and sharing of uh, the, the beauty of flowers with, with, with this people, especially uh, street vendors. Um, so it was a very, very loving and warm uh, project for me too, because it also in, in so many ways uh, allowed me to connect with people in different ways, because it was always a smile on people's face when we would give them flowers. And that immediately also uh, broke the tension between me and many other people who were around me. Um, I will, so let me encourage the audience to please type your questions, continue to type your questions in the Q&A. And while we wait for those to come in, um, I actually I have a few questions for you, but I'll start with one. Um, first of all, could you tell us a little bit more about your frame, your framework of decolonial ethnography? How is that different for you from other practitioners of the same, you know, in the context, in the specific context of Afghanistan? What does that context offer you that is, say, different from how other people practice decolonial ethnography? My, uh, I mean, I work on, on other decolonial um, and post-colonial scholars' work, and particularly in this uh, framework, I'm inspired by the work of Emma Perez, a, a Chicana uh, scholar who talks about this uh, relationship between institutions and, and also the researcher and in what ways uh, coloniality plays a major role and what is this border that we need to create or this uh, awareness of who we are as researchers or as scholars, as writers, especially when we engage with spaces that are still under certain uh, imperial or colonial occupations and violence. And in this particular uh, case, Afghanistan, has a very, very long history of relationship and connections with uh, imperial uh, powers and colonial powers. Uh, so, uh, and I'm also very aware of where my knowledge of queerness is coming from. And a lot of the knowledge that I have is not from Afghanistan. It's also a knowledge that I have taken from very colonial spaces and, 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 and I'm also, in a way, acknowledging that there's also an embedded uh, coloniality within queerness itself, because I can't even uh, translate queer in Farsi or Pashto, my native languages. And so when I was home and I was connecting with the queer community this uh, summer and also in the past couple of years on through uh, online platforms, I'm learning about the new language that people are using in Afghanistan that's very different. It doesn't uh, translate into English. These are uh, coded languages that allows people to, uh, to survive and also communicate with each other in very uh, familial and also public spaces without people understanding what they are and who they are talking about. 
and and so I'm learning that language and with them and the, the codes and how and why these words are coming. And I'm working with those also in other parts of my work. So this border of the, for for colonial decolonial is an important one because it 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 captures the very complicated relationship I have with writing and institutions and knowledge production, but also of my own interlocutors, because some of the people I was talking about are already now, in a way, in, in other borders, in colonial borders. They are either in the US, in Germany, in UK. And so they have crossed those other borders. So in what ways can we talk about it? So in a way, I also would want to like raise these questions. So I might not have the answer for it, but it's also for there to, to uh, gauge those questions about it. Thank you so much for that answer. And I'm looking at the questions that we have in the Q&A and many of them are about, you know, what is happening with those people now. Our next question is from Gabrielle Graves, who says, such a lovely project and presentation, thank you. Have you been in contact with the people you've just shared about and are they safe? Also, um, and I think you started to address this too, are the flowers you chose specifically from Afghanistan? Yes, so I, I've chosen five flowers and this was from um, the flowers that I've taken photos of um, in uh, my own uh, village in Afghanistan as in, in my own home um, where I first came to know uh, through these, my love for flowers and dancing around these flowers that I was queer. In a way, it's also a celebration of that, but it's also a celebration of the, the, the queer Afghans in, in, in so many ways. Um, I am in touch with a lot of the people that I uh, shared it uh, with all of them actually, uh, because uh, we, we had this bond that was very, very deep, despite uh, with some of them, I knew them from a long time before going to Afghanistan, and some I met them uh, recently, uh, but then, um, we, we stayed in touch and we still continue to, to talk, uh, but also some I mentioned that are, have been out, some of the queer people who are still left behind, we are still uh, I'm her working uh, to get them out uh, in the next week or so with, other, with the help of other people. So yeah, some of them are out, these people, some of them are still in, in Afghanistan and I am in touch with them. And I know that you yourself are personally involved in refugee work right now, and I can't imagine balancing that with being a professor <laughs> in this time. Um, we, our, next, our next question is from Iman Hassan, who writes, thank you for the beautiful talk. How can we disrupt the dominant discourse around Afghanistan and Afghan experiences that is so deeply connected to the military, industrial, and nonprofit NGO sector that is deeply invested in the imperialist, violent, capitalist project of domination abroad? It has been disturbing, but not surprising, how many quote unquote experts on Afghanistan are connected to the American enterprise of imperial violence. Thank you so much, Iman, for the very, very thought-provoking question and something that I've been continuously talking and thinking about. And as uh, I also mentioned at the very beginning that um, the, the conversations about Afghanistan has oftentimes in the past, not only in the past uh, months, but even before that has always happened in absence of Afghans. There is always this um, assumptions about Afghans that we are not, um, educated enough to be in those spaces, or we are not, uh, or if we are, we are too close to the topic. So therefore we are gonna be biased. All knowledge is biased. And so we need to acknowledge that. And who speaks on us or for us does really matter in these spaces. And the a lot of the panels that you see start with the departure of, of the US from Afghanistan. It wasn't a departure. It was a continuation of another violence. So it's important to, um, in, in some ways, I, I was very, very shocked that there was a panel actually yesterday by International Studies Association, which I'm also part of as a, um, a political scientist. And I flagged that 
to many people uh, who are actually working in, a, in organizing that panel that there is no Afghan on that panel. There were four people who were on board. All the four were white scholars of security studies. And the way that the panel description started was about the departure of the US and all that and what future holds for Afghans. And so the puzzle for me was like, why is the talk all around the security and, and, and the US when are we going to center Afghan voices and Afghan futures? And um, nothing happened. The, the panel still went as it was, despite the fact that we collectively wrote a letter against that. Um, and I think one way that we can boycott or in, in a way, um, in, in a decolonial sense, uh, penetrate through these uh, spaces is to create counter panels at the same exact time. I think that will be a strategy to also allow people to see a different perspective that I think it's enough that we have heard from these people. And one of the reasons that right now we are, Afghanistan is in, in this chaos was because of these people, because the, the, um, the international community, the aid uh, community, humanitarian community always listened to people who, was not, who were not from Afghanistan or who were from Afghanistan, but they spend their biggest part of their life in the diaspora away from the reality. And that's why we are here. That's why Afghanistan is still in war. That's why a lot of women are still at home and lost their uh, employment, their right to education, right to uh, freedom. And a lot of queer and trans people are now escaping. And that was because of all this uh, mess created by the international Western European communities. We have a related question um, about your own work from Aya Bande Ahmadi, who writes such a beautiful and real presentation, way to drive home how it's impossible to separate sexuality and gender expectations from war and violence, and how they are central to changing violent histories. How do you prefer we spread the word about the work you are doing? Can we share the photos on Instagram, or do you prefer that we direct people to your website or your work elsewhere? How can we support more of this work? Thank you so much for that question. Yeah, um, I think it's important that to see my work uh, brings that human aspect of Afghanistan that is uh, missing because the conversation and the debate and books have been all about the military. And right now, even people are so centered around veterans uh, trauma of what how they are feeling with what's happening in Afghanistan. There's a lot of funds directed towards that. So this particular work uh, is not in public right now. I am working in into making it accessible and trying to um, bring into these stories of people. Uh, but also I'm waiting for a lot of these people to be in safe places where I will be able to also share about this because I also don't want to make this public while they're also on, on the run. Although. I have changed the identities, names, and even faces. I've I've covered them, but it's still I want to be uh, very um, attentive to these sensitivities at this point. But whenever it's available in, in in the public domain in future, I will let everybody know. And you can also just I will probably update people through uh, my Twitter or any other uh, contacts that I have. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from Sajid Hussein, who is a graduate student at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. Um, he asks, I'm curious if there are perhaps any books you can recommend to us on the queer Afghan experience where we can learn more about queer and trans communities and how they navigate life in Afghanistan, whether it's poetry, nonfiction, or prose. I imagine it may be limited though because of maybe translation and censorship. Uh, thank you so much for this question. Yes, the resources about queer and trans Afghans are very, very limited. Um, um, there are not many. The Carpet Seller is one uh, novel that uh, Chenton uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, there's also um, a lot of short pieces that I've written about the experience of queerness uh, in Afghanistan that is available just if you search my, my name. Um, there's also a lot of uh, poetry um, and work uh, by uh, Wazina Zendon, um, 
as, as a Muslim Afghan uh, queer person that you can look up. There's also um, the Afghan Writers Association here. They post some of the work of queer people to look for, uh, but uh, unfortunately we don't have a, a, a wider selection of the work which hopefully will come now that a lot of people are in uh, scattered or a lot of people are getting this sense of writing more about Afghanistan because there's always knowledge written about us. So hopefully we'll have a lot more in future. Mm -hmm. We actually have another question from Chintan, which is what are the Pashto and Dari words that queer, non-binary and trans folks in Afghanistan use to identify themselves or talk about their relationships? Great question. Um, so the the words that they use um, are the community in, in a sense, it's also collective. So it's a crowd that which I really loved was that it's not also divided by language. It's not that this is only Pashtuns use this word or uh, Tajiks use it, this word. It's a queer Afghan or trans Afghan language. The, the, the word that they refer to themselves is Morat, uh, Morat, Shah, and they also use the word Degarbash, which means somebody who's living the other life in, in that sense. Um, we have about 10 questions waiting for you, but you know, since we have until uh, 2.15, let's, let's see what we can do here. The next question is from Loai Al-Ara. Thank you for this presentation and your work. I was wondering, how do you establish these connections in which people are able to trust you and share their stories with you? Also, when working with peoples located outside the quote unquote West who thus might not speak English or have knowledge of Western labels of sexuality, how do you translate and convey their identity in line with their native knowledge and phrasing? Excellent question, because I'm sort of struggling with that, the language aspect of it. That in, in a lot of this work is also lost in translation because especially sexuality and gender, I still am not comfortable even considering myself genderqueer because there is no framing of that in my own um, native languages. So I think we all are living with that tension and in, in what ways we produce knowledge about ourselves and in what ways to make it accessible, but also being aware that this knowledge in, in a way, we are also borrowing the language, uh, the wording from other uh, languages. Um, so the relationship that I have established based, is based on uh, my own life in Afghanistan. Uh, I have also a very well uh, wide network of family and friends and colleagues in Afghanistan and that I have maintained despite living here um, in the US um, because I used to go back and forth uh, quite often. Uh, but now with the queer and trans community, particularly uh, my initial connection started with my work here and then some of them would see it and reach out to me and that's how we started connecting and then also was introduced to the clandestine social media uh, spaces where a lot of this happens. And so I also credit all those other diaspora queer Afghans and trans Afghans who have made it possible and in a way they have troubled and challenged a lot of the mainstream social media spaces by being themselves, by presenting the very queer and trans Afghan um, side that people are feeling much more comfortable now uh, to, to reach out and talk about these issues, but also establish those friendships. Particularly when I went to Kabul, I went with knowing just two people uh, from the queer and trans community personally. I knew them from social media and other spaces, but we had never met. And um, it was so heartwarming for me that they welcomed me so quickly. And as you said, with a trust that they trusted me because they knew I speak their language. They knew I was from there. They also knew uh, many other people that we knew and had in connection. So all of that allowed them to, in a way, to trust. And also I shared these photos with, with them. Um, I asked them for permission and what ways I can use it. I also updated uh, the things I do here, the, the way I talk about them and the way I gather support for them. So I share all of those with them. 
so that they are involved in all the process and the work that I do. So they're not just these interlocutors that I extract knowledge from and walk away from. That's not how um, a decolonial ethnography would be done uh, with justice. Thank you for that. Um, we have a two-part question from Supriya Nair, who is a professor of English here, uh, who asks, were you thinking, first part is, were you thinking of flower power here, um, the flower in the gun trope from the iconic 1967 photo, or the flower, the use of flowers as symbols of resistance to violence and war in the context of the Vietnam War and the 1960s here? Um, and then the second part of this uh, question is the faces in the photos are hidden, but are the names changed? Yeah, so I'll start with the last part. Yes, the names have changed and also uh, so as a lot of other information about them, um, just like their faces also. But then, yeah, the flowers, I actually am inspired by what was happening also in Vietnam and the photo 1960s and, um, but also they, Flower, in many senses, the inspiration comes from also my own relationship with flowers and every other Afghan's relationship with flowers uh, in Afghanistan because it was so present in everybody's life. And um, I remember that uh, when the first time we, we left Kabul for Pakistan, I was a kid and we had to abandon our house and escape and it was, uh, during summer. And I remember that my dad had like was heartbroken and was very, very depressed for days thinking about the flowers that he left behind in our garden. Who's going to water them? And that was his main concern. And so that also in so many ways became, as, as the question also frames it, as resistance to war and violence, because in some ways it also allowed us to escape from that. And even when I went back, the presence of flowers in every place, in every corner of Kabul was in a way also a reminder that the side of Afghanistan is really absent in, in the representation of Afghans in Afghanistan in the mainstream media. Uh, but also in, uh, it's also uh, to speak speaking to and against the, the very queer narrative of Afghans that came post 9-11 in some ways that uh, Thomas Dorsak, who is a, a Dutch photographer, took po photos of, uh, found photos and films of Afghans from uh, photo studios. And then he uh, printed them and then created a book called The Taliban. So in those photos, you see people staging uh, these photos with flowers in the photo studios and they have guns or some sort of other things around them. Um, he had no idea these people were Taliban because he didn't know who these people were. And if you look at them and I look at my family photos from 30 years ago, uh, it resembles that because we all had uncles and aunts and everyone who would wear those kind of clothes or wear take pictures with fake flowers or with a gun because gun was always everywhere. So in a way, it's also speaking to those that that this is how we live it. And this is that the guns, that the violence, the tanks that are everywhere are not product of Afghans. The flowers are. The violence is an imposed, um, Western imposed uh, presence and landscape in Afghanistan. That's really lovely, right? The idea that the flowers are what is Afghan about this landscape. Uh, we have two questions from Kristen Waterbury, um, who is another colleague here, uh, who asks, I've heard people talk about how coming out is a Western concept. I am curious about your thoughts on that. And the second question is, how will the latest developments in Afghanistan impact your work? Uh, yes, I am quite... Um aware of the Western uh, forces around coming out and how Western it is. And that's why I'm also uh, not comfortable with that. And there's also we as Muslims in general um, live that coming out in multiple ways and versions in complicated ways. And that was what makes it very beautiful. 
I am a queer person who's writing all this work and working this, but I'm not out to my family. I was with them this summer. My mom, my mom for example, made me uh, a gown, a dress that I always dreamed to have. Um, and I wore it, I danced and trolled in it, but there was no question of anyone that, are you queer? Why are you doing this? And because it's also in some ways this, it's accepted in whatever way that you want to be around your family members and they, they love you no matter what. The more I lived in the US, it actually, I created that, I created that image of my family to be anti-queer because it was constantly like imposed on me that Muslim families are anti-queer and Afghan families are anti-queer. And so I just started thinking about it and believing it. And when I went home, it wasn't the case. And so coming out for a lot of these people that I showed even in the images in Afghanistan, it's very complex. They, they are in and out of these spaces. So coming out has very multiple meanings and they, uh, they live in multiple closets. So coming out is not so clean and clear and it's okay. It's okay to have a messy coming out and coming in and, and going back to the closet. And that's what's important. And the, what, what's happening in Afghanistan in some ways, yeah, it has impacted my work because I was hoping to return back to Afghanistan this, uh, this winter and go back in the summer and go for a whole year to, to do research, to, to be with my people, but that's not possible anymore. So I will have to do this work from afar and I will have to be for my queer and trans community from afar, but uh, the return is, has become very impossible right now. Mm -hmm. We have uh, questions from Wazina Zondan, uh, who asks, what words of advice or counsel or wonderings do, would you like to share? Um, and then specifically, how might we as individuals ensure that the white gaze or the colonizer's gaze assimilation-centric training is interrupted when our, or when our kin, queer, trans, gender non-conforming and none, are experiencing support in the countries that have received them? Great question. Um, I think being close to those communities because um, one way is that a lot of right now from my own, my own work that I'm doing these evacuations work, I started it on my own and successfully I was able to get 17 people out with very little support that I got. And this was the very first batch of queer and trans, my call to my babies who got out so hopefully I'll have other groups to get out. Uh, and that was possible because I had that very personal investment and love for these people. And, and when it comes from people who don't have a connections with Afghanistan, who don't have any love, or especially when they come, it comes from the uh, international community as a form of aid and humanitarian assistance, it is, in, in void of that love and passion for these people. It, they are seen as just another group of people they want to help. And they rather go to sleep than actually do this help when it's needed. And I, as a person who is connected to these people, have spent so many sleepless nights because I knew that my sleeping might possibly endanger somebody's life. So why should I not just stay and help them? But that wasn't the case. In pe with people that I worked with in the right when they were supposed to go to the airport and they had to send people with them, their phone got was off and they went to bed because sleep was important to them than sending these people to the uh, Kabul airport to get, get evacuated. And so um, one way that we can entrap those is by being close to these communities, especially those who are getting out and those who are staying in Kabul how we can offer help for them because I don't think that the international community after all this evacuation and media and everything is over will care about those who are stuck in Afghanistan and the Taliban. It's us who need to be much more proactive and reaching out for support whether these are funds, whether this is helping from afar, whether it's getting them out still. I think those are the things that we need to do on our own because the international community is not going to be there. Um, we have a question um, that relates to, or a two-part question that relates to what you're saying about care. This question is from Silai Karzai. Thank you for sharing and bringing these stories to us, Kaijan. 
Would you talk a little bit more about, for, first, would you talk a little bit more about translating languages regarding queerness in Afghanistan? And then how do you take care of yourself in the midst of uncertainty or ambivalence regarding which codes can be unspoken or spoken? Thank you so much. So about uh, translating, um, I was aware of coded words that existed in Afghanistan among queer and trans communities because it was always in reference to things that would protect us. How should we create? And that was also back in the day here because uh, in the US, for example, people would say, oh, I'm friends of Darty back in the day when I hear about it. And so that was like, oh, I'm queer. Um, and that is emerging in Afghanistan and it's always been, and not that they are inspired by a Western queer language, but because they are inspired by their own um, ancestors and roots that were also at once queer and, and celebrated. Um, so the languages that they're coming up with, um, they're very, very coded. A lot of people would not understand at all what they are talking about. Um, and that's, I think, the beauty of it. And they don't teach that language also to those who are not queer or trans. And that's also a very political in intention that they have, that we need to keep this among ourselves. If somebody asks, what does this mean? Don't tell them. Because this word can easily be translated and then people will know about it. So one uh, power about is that it is kept within the community. And about my own care, I think, uh, I'll think about it when everybody's out or the people that I have um, to get out. And in some ways, it is also a form of care for me when I know that they are safe. It is a form of care for me when I know that I talk to them and they're alive. And so we do those for like care work through group calls and chats and video calls so that we are there for each other. And some of them um, don't have any connections to the West. So they don't, they never work for any organization. They don't have friends and family. And so these individuals like me and other people who are working uh, to get them out are the very few hopes they have. And so I think that itself is care when we care for them. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Jamie White who writes, thank you for the amazing presentation. As a gender fluid person, I have experienced issues with the English terminology around queer identities as they tend to assume someone has a gender which doesn't change. I'm interested if there is a different way of expressing gender fluidity that exists in quote unquote non-Western societies like Afghanistan. Um, so, the beauty of Farsi, the language that I grew up with, also Pashto, uh, Pashto is gendered, but Farsi is not gendered. So the, the, the pronoun uh, uh, that is not gendered or it's commonly used for the person is O, and O refers to anyone, to any human being, that person, that's all it means. And I think that has allowed people to be gender fluid. Afghanistan is, I mean, the language itself, the culture, the traditions are very gender fluid. And like the colors and, and we, we have, the relationships people form, the friendships they form are not binary. They are not tied to any sort of gender. However, there are some influences from the West that is really in a way traveling that and perpetuating this very Western ideas of gender on people that to the point that when I was there, um, men hold hands just in public with like any, a lot of Muslim countries do. Um, but then I was hearing from people that it's considered gay, though they would use the word gay in the West if people hold hands. And so they, some people are becoming more aware of that. And that's the, the, the very painful part of that, that that friendship that is formed between same sex people uh, irregardless of any sexual tension is now uh, gendered and, and seen as in this form of sexual uh, sense that is very Western and very, very uh, foreign to us. 
Thank you. Um, I think we have maybe time for one more question, um, which is from Amna Batul. Thank you, sir, for your talk. Um, could you talk about how do you anticipate the future of queer in current circumstances? Um, and they also point out that it is being said that women in Afghanistan will assert for their rights again in two to three years from now. Um, can you repeat the first part? Yeah, um, could you talk about how do you anticipate the future of queer, um, not queerness, but just queer in current circumstances? So with the question of queer future, um, I think about Afghan future, um, we're scattered so many places and so many across different borders. Um, I think we are one of the few countries that have the diaspora all around the world and, and through different waves of refugee crisis, displacements and, and, and foreign uh, occupations. Um, the future of queer and trans Afghan is not only in Afghanistan, but it's also in the diasporas. It's everywhere. And I think um, the new generation in Afghanistan is much more connected to their roots, to the sense of queerness and the queer love that have really, really, really like connected them and kept them in communities. Uh, I think they don't, they are not gonna give up on that future. And it's very, very shocking when I see from outside world how quickly they have given up on hope for Afghanistan. But those who are living in Afghanistan, they haven't. And that's the beauty of it. Those queer and trans people in Afghanistan they haven't given hope. I was reading at the very beginning of this chaos that started happening la last month from diasporic Afghans that I have no hope in Afghanistan. But that's easy to say it when you're sitting in your fancy house in, in an apartment in New York or in London. But it's also a very harsh reality to project that upon those who are actually in Afghanistan, who want to see that hope so that they can live and survive. And I think I see a very, very beautiful um, connected across different border future for queer and trans Afghans uh, that will not be bounded to one nation, to one state, but it's going to be flourishing from different borders and all around the world. But in terms of women, I don't think that Taliban um, are prepared for this for these Afghan women, because these Afghan women are not the Afghan women they faced in 1996. These Afghan women are highly educated. They have already been in leadership positions. They have been activists. They have been artists. They have been doctors and lawyers, and they're not going to sit at home. So they will be resisting. And you we can see those resistance on the streets of Kabul. We will see it on social media. And a lot of this resistance is also not projected. We don't see a lot of it, but it is happening. And they will have to uh, create space for Afghan women. Otherwise, they will take those spaces by themselves. So we are hopeful that this is going to change uh, and this resistance of Afghan women, Afghans in general, but also the support for them continues in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important counterpoint to this ongoing assumption of the passivity of Afghan women. Um, I, I'll ask you one last question because it's come up twice in the remaining questions, um, once by Sanobar Mirza and Nazreen Sajadi, who ask, um, what can we do here to support the LGBTQIA community in Afghanistan? And then we'll end. There are multiple ways to support. Um, the easiest will be filling out forms <laughs> because I think it's been a month and I don't know how many forms I have filled out for different organizations and countries that they have offered to help. And they come back with very, very bizarre requests. Can you put a comma in this, in this box and can you shift this in app? And while we are here trying to rescue and, and offer help with these people whose lives are threatened by Taliban and by this regime. And then they just disappear. Of course, they never come back to help, but they are very particular about their forms. So I think reaching out and filling out some of these forms that might lead us to somewhere, some evacuations, 
Uh, if you are willing to do those sort of help, reach out to me or other activists and organizers who are doing that. But also um, knowing that some of these people will be out, maybe if they're in Ireland and Canada and the US, their life are gonna be uprooted because they will be leaving every support that they have behind. So we need to continue to support them. You can do fundraising for them. Um, you can also reach out to uh, parliamentarians to see which ones are the right ones to actually gauge in conversation to push um, their governments to accept more refugees, especially queer and trans refugees, because Canada, US, Germany, France, they all have promised to get and receive more LGBTQ refugees, but they haven't actually done that in practice. And so to make sure that they are doing that and writing letters and making sure that you're also connected to these people at home. And a lot of them are also lonely, just talking to them and, and saying that we are here to help you. That helps because a lot of times they feel like they have been abandoned uh, by everyone. They have been abandoned by the international community, but we shouldn't be abandoning them as individuals, especially as queer and trans Afghans ourselves. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much to our guest speaker, Dr. Ahmad Kais Munhazim, for that beautiful talk today. Um, as a reminder, uh, if you want to hear about similar events from U of M Global Islamic Studies, including the rest of our Afghanistan speakers and film and our Halaloween Muslim horror film series, please sign up for our newsletter. Um, and I would also encourage you to follow Kais on Twitter. Um, where he, where, where you know, they have a very, very, very interesting and vociferous presence um, that I enjoy reading all the time, um, and also to check out their website. So we'll end here, and thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali and Anna, for organizing this. Thank you.